Yes. Well, my friends, we're back with another uh, a word? splendiferous episode of V8 Radio. Splendiferous? Splendiferous. And that, Kevin, is probably the most accurate adjective we've ever given on the show, as it means informal and humorous. Wow. And I didn't know we were either one of those. I, well, <laughs> I think one guy said so, maybe. Right. Well, that's better than being uh, non-splendiferous. True, true. Very yeah, true. Right. All right. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Kevin Oste, joined, as always, by my esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Hubal Clark. And uh, this episode is a little bit different because uh, I was a bonehead and forgot some of my audio recording gear, so we're trying uh, different technology, which is going to sound a little different. Do not attempt to adjust your <laughs> device. <laughs> we are in <laughs> full control. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but... <laughs> At least we're rolling. That's the important part. Right on. Yeah. So um, for those who are familiar with our VA radio experience, uh, uh, we typically start off each episode with some form of a trivia question, uh, generally automotive related. And uh, yeah. And I, I will say, um, although I did, we did get some good feedback on our last episode about the show being informative and perhaps entertaining. I personally want to apologize for how long we kind of dragged out the uh, <laughs> the trivia question part of the show. That's not that's not your fault. <clears throat> well, not at all. It, it was my fault a little bit. And, and well, I, I mean, I, you asked the question, but I hemmed and hawed for an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I must admit that the uh, the Richard the Hawk question or whatever it was, happy happy to hawk. Um, was kind of a kick in the nuts. So uh, I, I do have a question that I know you're not going to get and you wouldn't be happy about, but I'm not that kind of guy to actually use it. You're a nice guy. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe I'll just hold on to that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for, for when you're really mad at me or something. Well, I uh, see our our, uh, <clears throat> our listener, Paul, our buddy Paul, had pointed out, he's like, yeah, you owe him for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that was, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that's like asking Michael Jordan a question about Air Jordan shoes, and he gets it wrong. You know, you're asking me Buick yeah. stuff. So that's true. I, I I thought that you would have known it. That's why I asked it. I didn't think it was going to be that that uh, that harsh of a question. So yeah. my apologies. That's okay. I learned. I looked at it as a learning experience. So okay, good. Yeah. All right. So uh, do, you, do you have one prepared for this week? Yes, sir, I do. I do. And I'm, I'm moving away from Buick and gonna go towards our friends at Chrysler Corp. Oh boy. Yeah, good times. All right. Uh, as you know, Kevin, in, uh, 1968, uh, Dodge had a lineup of muscle cars that they called the Scat Pack. Yeah. And Plymouth had, uh, same group called the Rapid Transit System. Yeah, Rapid Transit System. Mm -hmm. All right. The 68 Dodge muscle cars consisted of what cars? In the uh, Scat Pack? Yes. <clears throat> well, you could get a Dodge uh, Dart. You could get a Dodge Charger. You could get a Dodge, let's see, 68. I know it was definitely Dart and Charger. The Challenger didn't come out until till later. Uh, boy, I was just not thinking Mopar, and, and this is putting me on the spot. Oh, there was a, uh, a Dodge. Um, there's a B body in there, so maybe one of the Super Bs. Because the Roadrunner is a Plymouth, right? So th those those three are my initial guesses. So the Charger, the Dart, and the Super B. Yes. Okay. Duly noted, my friend. Yeah. If I get this wrong, I'm going to feel like a big putz too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but really, uh, my mind was very contextual, and I was not in this context. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I'm, I'm usually, I'm rarely in any type of context, which is why I get all of mine wrong. Yeah. And, uh, interestingly, I also have a, a Mopar themed trivia question for you. Oh, who's a lucky boy? Yeah. How about that? <laughs> how about that? 
And as you know, in uh, in the mid 1980s, our friends at the uh, Chrysler Corporation were playing with your buddy Carol Shelby. Uh huh. And they created a, a couple of very interesting little cars. Um, one of them was based on the uh, on the Dodge Omni platform. Uh huh. And it was a little black car called the GLH. Do you remember that? I, I kind of do, yeah. Yes, <clears throat> the Dodge Shelby GLH, and then also the GLHS Turbo. And uh, it, it looked like an Omni. It was a four-door county box, and it was just not attractive. But it, <laughs> it, it, had, some, it had some power, a little turbo 2.2 motor right. in the GLHS. And uh, uh, there was a famous article in Hot Rod Magazine where they raced one against a, an actual original 65 GT350 Mustang. And wow. the GLHS beat it Ooh. in the quarter, quarter mile. That hurts. So, so the trivia question is, what does GLH stand for? God dang it. Um, GLH. Isn't that a product for for bald guys called Great Looking Hair? Uh, it could be. <laughs> it was not a GLC being a great looking car by right. any stretch. <laughs> um, great Looking Hatch, GLH. All right. Okay. Great Looking Hatch. See how I didn't drag that out this time? You didn't, and I really wanted to drag mine out because I'm going through everything in my mind right now saying you're an idiot. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. I'll, t- I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. If, if anything pops into your head before the 30-minute mark, I'll, I'll let you throw it down there. Ooh, right it, on. Because I'm a nice guy. You are a nice guy. No Googling allowed. I can't even Google. I My laptop is fried. We're recording this on phones, and I, I've got nothing. So I couldn't okay. Google if I wanted to. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll do that. So, um, good. So your final answer, great looking hatch. Great looking hatch. Okay. So uh, that is duly noted. And uh, what uh, what the heck else is going on? Shoot, man. I haven't, uh, I haven't done diddly squat to my engine since the last time we talked. Oh, man. <sighs> I was um I was out of town for a week. I won I won a trip uh from my company to go fishing for a week up in Canada. So yeah, I, awesome. Yeah, it was great. It was just the the decompressing getaway I needed. It was fantastic. So caught a lot of fish, had a lot of fun, good times. That's, that's but no, no car work was done. No, no. It's hard to do that while you're fishing. True. True. Yeah. But that's all right. Yeah. But I've been watching uh, this last Muscle Car of the Week. That Sh- that Shelby Series 1 was pretty pretty neat little car. That, you know, that was a heck of a car. And I don't know if you remember in the late 90s when those were being produced. Um, you know, Shelby's got this this interesting kind of love-hate relationship with his fans throughout the different time periods of history, you know, so everybody loved him in the sixties. And then in the eighties, when he was doing cars like that GLH, everybody kind of hated him because they're like, what is this garbage? Right. Uh, And then he kind of dabbled in some other stuff. But when it came time to do the series one, a lot of people looked at it as just a chance for a Shelby money grab to try and, you know, put his name on something and, and get money out of it. But, you know, really, that, that couldn't be farther from the truth because he invested a bunch of cash, as did others, into right. that Series 1 project. It wasn't just what, again, many people thought happened later with some of the the Mustangs, again, from the 2000s, where it was a Shelby Series Mustang that really didn't have much done to it, but it had the name, so they charged a lot more. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the bigger part of that story that we didn't get into on Muscle Car of the Week is that the federal government was a big player in that car from the standpoint of in order to make a production vehicle, which is what he was trying to do, he needed to uh, 
have certifications done so that it passed smog and crash standards. Right. And in order to do that, you've got to spend millions of dollars oh, to yeah. have independent testing and everything else. And, and the kicker is that you could be crash certified, but they do it by model year. And the standard, if you change the car or a certain amount of time goes by, that standard goes away, and you have to reapply and do it again. Oof. So Shelby had some investors when they were doing the Series 1, and they had some problems um, like any any car does that is being made by, you know, enthusiasts, essentially. And during the time period, the the company went bankrupt that was kind of the parent company, so Shelby pulled resources together to buy it out of bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar and continue the car. But when that happened, the certification certificate didn't stick, and mm. he didn't have the money to recertify it all. So they got around that by selling the last however many, I think 60 or 80 cars, without the engine and transmission. So they were technically kit cars. Ah, and nice. Nice loophole. Yeah, it was, a, it was a total loophole, but then everybody's like, you know, there already are Shelby kit cars. They, they call them 427 Cobras, and uh-huh. a lot of people didn't like those either. So now you're, uh-huh. they, they thought he was kind of dropping to this level of you-build-it Shelbys. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and there's always this little stank of, you know, bankruptcies are suspect to begin with in certain businesses because it's like, well, what really happened there? You know, is this uh, something snaky going on? Oh, snaky, sorry. Snaky, is nice. It- <laughs> well played. Nicely done. <laughs> some, some snaky going on or not. And, and, and so all that became the big story of the car. And unfortunately, the car itself um, kind of stepped out of the limelight because people were too busy talking about the gossip. And... Uh, the other, you know, kind of black eye against those cars was that he was working with GM at the time, and it had that old Aurora engine, which was a pretty cool engine until you had to work on one. Sure. And 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 that's the one that famously has the starter mounted underneath the intake manifold. Oh yeah, it's just like a, like a North Star. Uh, right. It's a small displacement North Star essentially, yeah. and those were great concepts that proved to be troublesome on the street eventually. Mm-hmm. So. That reputation had kind of preceded that engine, and people were like, yeah, we're not so sure about those. Mm. And, and then, of course, the interior being essentially Pontiac, Firebird, and Oldsmobile Aurora pieces, it looked very GM plastic, and and, yeah. and that was a bummer. Yeah, there's a lot of potential in there to really create a really nice interior in that car. Yeah, that mid-'90s plastic stuff was really... Really pretty awful stuff, I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, but at the time, again, um, you didn't have rapid prototyping. You didn't have 3D right. printing. You know, you didn't have the, the stuff that a, an individual can do today. So he did with what he could without putting a whole bunch of money in the, in the cockpit mm-hmm. because the chassis was, was really pretty killer. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. It was an, an all aluminum chassis that was, uh, a combination of, uh, you know, tubing and rails plus some sheets, and then the whole thing was was kind of heat treated. Um, I don't want to call it like a furnace braze, but it was uh, a heat treated process to put rigidity back into the welded structure and utilized uh, some Corvette suspension and brake parts. And I drove that Series One not much, just kind of around the parking lot a little bit, mm-hmm. basically moving it around. And I will tell you. Feeling a, a, a very lightweight car like that that has power is just fun, you know? Oh, I and, can't. and it revved up real nice and it sounded great and it had killer brakes. And all of a sudden I didn't really care about the Trans Am dashboard <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and kind of the, the fact that I didn't really have any room for my feet. Um, but it, it, um, it drove really nice and, and, uh, like I said, it handled great and I don't, I don't really think that that was intended to be a competition car like the Cobras were. It was intended to be a street roadster and right. maybe kind of, you know, thumb the nose towards the Viper because that arrangement had dissipated between Shelby and Dodge at that point. And, uh, you know, 
kind of a, a thumb the nose of the Corvette too, in some ways, because he was he was always fighting against Corvettes his entire career. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it it was a neat little deal, and and I was we were trying to look past the shortcomings of the company. You know, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you a parallel. If I'm around in 20 years and this stuff is still cool, we'll be doing an episode just like this on a Tesla. Oh, yeah, you probably will. Because it's oh, the same man. thing. You know, it's trying to do something. One guy takes a bunch of money. Public opinion is is what it is. But at the end of the day, you got to look at the car and go, oh, that was actually kind of cool. Yeah. Well, dude, those those. Tesla P100Ds when the ludicrous mode are ridiculously quick. They are. They're insane. They are. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous even. <laughs> it's ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh man, that's beautiful. <laughs> and, and I have a, a good friend who's got uh, he's got two of them. Um, he's got uh, and, and forgive me, I'm a little slow on my nomenclature of, of Teslas. But he's got, uh, you know, I think a an S sedan and maybe a Model X SUV deal, right? Is that mm-hmm. what that is? I think so. His wife drives that. And um, he, he's he got a lot of fast cars. I mean, he's got a Hellcat. He's, I think he's on a second Hellcat. He's had uh, a twin turbo all-wheel drive Mercedes. And Oof. he swears up and down, you know, that the Tesla is by far the, the most fun acceleration-wise to drive. You know, I, it, do, I it doesn't. It. It doesn't have the Hellcat, you know, V8 Fury going on, but right. um, yeah. But so when you can apply full torque instantly, you're in for hell, heck for a ride. Especially on those, um, the D and the P100D is a uh, dual motor, so you got a front and you got all wheel drive, front and rear motors in right. that car, and it just <clears throat> it grips. Boy, howdy! Oh, it's wicked, yeah, and. I've always been fascinated with, um, you know, I like the end result in a lot of ways. And believe me, obviously, by watching Muscle Car of the Week, I appreciate original cars and, and, you know, not disturbing that. But at the end of the day, if the goal is to build something that's going to go fast, um, that that's a pretty cool way to do it. And the owner of that, that, that I was just talking about, he and I and, and the guys in our shop have been talking about um, – Kind of the best of all worlds for a muscle car guy, and and maybe we find a uh, a seventy Challenger and get a damaged Tesla with the all wheel drive, and mm. put those two together, and and I I advance that to a Cuda and we'd call it the electric eel, you know, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and it would have the power, um, the instant torque. And, you know, we wouldn't start with a, with a Hemi car or something obvious. Right. We'd start with a six cylinder, yeah, you know. And a slant six car. Yeah, or even you, you can get almost the whole Dynacorn Cuda these days. So, oh, yeah. uh, you know, we could build something and, and he, he would really love to because he loves the look of the, the old car and the performance of the new. And last year at SEMA, I had talked to a gentleman who used a team in Sweden to hack the Tesla operating system. Oh boy. And what they were able to do is they call them power modules, and it's the motor. I think it's the motor, the gearbox, and maybe the battery or one of the batteries. They're modules. So the, the, the four-wheel drive car has two power modules in it that are essentially the same thing. And, and that's the beauty of his platform is the, the middle of the floor, I think, is where all the batteries are. And you can just build whatever wheelbase you want. You can build whatever kind of thing you want on top. You know, yeah. it's just like changing out bodies on an RC car, basically. Yeah, kind of. And uh, But the trick was, in order to make one of these things run, you need all the components. So you need the interior body module, you need the steering module, the brake module. All these things are networked right. together. Mm-hmm. And if it senses there's nothing there, it's not going to work. And that's what these dudes in Sweden hacked, is the ability to control that without having the rest of the car. That's amazing, so, because... Tesla does not like you doing that. No, no. <laughs> they they are not happy about that. In fact, if you, I, I watched some YouTube videos of this guy that rebuilds Teslas that are wrecked and they're totaled, and he'll he'll find one in the junkyard and he'll strip the components and he'll build a nice car. However, Tesla 
will not support that car at all. They will not get any updates. They won't allow um, the supercharger uh, to, to function. They won't sell them parts. Right. It's amazing. And they, I mean, they keep that really locked down pretty tight. And the supercharger is the electric recharge station. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's not a blower. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and and that's what these guys were saying is that um, Tesla has the ability to turn those cars off. So that yep. that guy who rebuilds those, he could be going on the road, and if they're aware of that thing, they can just switch it off yeah. from the sky, and he's out of out of business. Right. So these dudes had to get away around just using the hardware essentially and putting their own software in it to make it all come together. Right. So we immediately had these conversations about, you know, do you want to build this car? And like all these projects, it comes down to how much do you want to invest in it because it's not going to be cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't think it would be super ridiculous either. Um, I think you could get something that drives that maybe isn't very pretty. Mm-hmm. Uh, fairly economically, and, you know. Of course, if you're going to do it, though, you're going to make it nice, and you're going to want it to look right. nice too. So, yeah. Uh, but it would be super cool. It would be pretty cool. I like. I I dig technology, and I, and I like bringing together the new with the old to see what you can make out of it. But um, yeah, and and pretty slick. Trevor and and Tyler, our technicians, and at, at the V8 Speed Resto, were talking about how. If the goal is to just make power and go fast, you know, then this is all okay. But then again, at the same time, we deal with people that, you know, if you put an LS motor in something, they get mad. Mm-hmm. So we would, we, we absolutely would make people mad about, you know, ruining that car mm-hmm. by electrifying it. Right. Um, of course, we'd probably turn on a whole different audience and, and get them excited about it too. Yeah. Um, I think the, the validation would come from your first trip behind the wheel. <laughs> yeah, it sure would. That would that would turn someone around real quick, I think. Yeah, yeah. And again, with with total respect to existing cars and not ruining, you know, something. So that part's really cool. The downside is, and I'm not going to, you know, express a personal opinion either way. But when you look at Elon Musk and and the way the business is going, there's a lot of people who are true believers, you know, like the, uh, the Apple crowd. <laughs> yep. Um, and, and they're the ones that put the money down ahead of time and there's not even a car. Mm-hmm. And then there are those who have more conservative business policies who say that's unethical and how could you even do that? And then they look at the fact that he's, you know, hemorrhaging what seems to be, you know, uh, um, expon, you know, it, not exponential, but but increasingly rising amounts of money every month, mm-hmm. and at some point it's got to end. And the thing that sucks is he's a visionary, whether you dig the car or not. And and we need people like that, and I think we need him here in the Agreed. U.S. Agreed. So I'm not I'm not excusing how things are going, but I think we need more people to take that risk and push things. Um, for all of us. Right on. Yeah. Could agree there's, more. <laughs> <laughs> there's my, uh, you know, my, my civics uh, <laughs> statement of the day. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a quiz later on, folks. Yeah, well, you know, recently I've, I've been finding myself um, kind of getting... Well, I'll tell you what's happening is, uh, um, fortunately, I did get hired by SEMA again to, to do some Heck work. Yeah, right on. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I'm very grateful and excited about doing that. And, of course, I, I, I want to be in the best form that I can be in to make sure that that goes well. Right. And that uh, they get something that they like and, and everything goes well. So in preparation, I'm a couple of months out still, um, but trying to get back into uh, some semblance of better physical condition and trying to be a little mentally sharper and, and, uh, because I'm going to be working for them basically all week straight, uh, which is, which is great, uh, but it's going to require some mental and physical stamina. Right. So Monday, um, like last year, they, they hired me to do the SEMA reveal again, which is just a, a super cool event where we'll be showing off. Uh, last year we did 15. I don't know how many cars we're going to do this year, but 
uh, some of the halo cars that are going into the show and their builders come up on stage and, and, uh, we do a quick interview and talk about the car and it's a chance for the, the media to get photos and video out before the show starts. Yeah. Um, last year the, they had a band there. It was James Otto and, uh, James is a great mix of kind of a country blues, uh, rock and roll performer, just tremendous chops. It was, and he's a car guy. Uh, uh, it's turned into a pretty good friend. This year, um, there's a, a female blues singer uh, named ZZ Ward you might have heard of. Um, mm. She's done some stuff, uh, I think, for major network TV on, on one of the NASCAR opens. And, uh, and she's a heck of a guitar player. So I recommend looking her up if you dig blues. And she'll be performing on stage all week uh, and Monday night. So I get to interact with her, which will be cool. Dig it. And then uh, Tuesday morning, I'm hosting the New Products Breakfast, which is uh, a place where awards are given out to new products from the SEMA show, and that's kind of a banquet-style thing. And then Tuesday through Friday, uh, I'll be back in the chair at the SEMA Central stage. Nice. Going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. And then uh, Friday, it all wraps up with an event called the SEMA Cruise, which is where all the cars leave the show to go to the SEMA Ignited event. And uh, a good friend of mine, a guy named Joe Sebergandio, who I used to work with, um, he's been kind of the MC of that over the years. And this year, uh, I get to join him, and we're working that one together. Oh, terrific. I've seen the cruise on Friday. So, yeah, Monday to Friday, man, it's the, it's the whole time. So in my quest to sharpen up, if you will, um, uh-huh. I've been doing a lot of walking at night. Oh, good. Uh, fast, fast kind of brisk walking, uh-huh. and to, to pass the time, I've been streaming interviews with people that, uh, you know, I find to be interesting or okay. insightful or influential, and, and I've done probably two weeks of every Neil Peart interview there is, and oh, Neil is, that is right? the, the drummer from Rush, Right, and uh, he's one of these guys um, who is is or was um, basically the best at at what he did. Um, Granted, there's other drummers that are equal or better, but to generalize, Neil's, you know, Neil's top of the game. Oh, yeah. For Um, a long time. Yes, right. And very disciplined and and very methodic and and knew he wanted to, to achieve that level. But the dimension of Neil that I never knew about was that um, being a rock and roll star has has consequences. You know, you're in the public eye, and and he pointed out that touring and Rush toured for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. Touring is actually pretty boring, you know, because you got your stage show for three hours, three and a half hours, and then you break down and you do nothing and travel to another city, and then everybody else sets it up, and then you go do your show again. So. In the downtime, in the 80s, what Neil would do is he got a bicycle, and he would go out, and when the when the tour bus arrived in the city, and they were starting to set up the show, he would go ride out in the country and just see stuff. Oh, right on. That's pretty cool. It was cool, and it was his way to kind of find some solitude, and then he'd come back and play a show. Well, in the 90s, that evolved into motorcycle riding. So okay. his... Um, his fuel, I mean, obviously he's passionate about being this incredible drummer, uh, but for him to escape and clear his mind and, and reconnect with the world was, uh, he had a tour bus and had a trailer and the trailer had his motorcycle and eventually a partner motorcycle. He had a riding partner and what they would do is he'd play the show and it, they'd go to sleep and he'd sleep on the bus. The bus would normally leave town and go up the road to a rest stop or something and then they'd, they'd sleep. And the first thing in the morning, he'd get up, go to the trailer, unhitch the bike, and would ride to the next city. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And, and he, he became more excited about the space in between the shows than the shows themselves. And he, oh. he loved the shows, but yeah. for him, his, his mental growth and, and kind of therapy came from riding place to place. The first year, he went 55,000 miles on the motorcycle. Holy cow. Yeah, ended up going from northern 
North America, Canada, all the way down uh-huh. through South, South America. He was, you know, riding in countries when nobody, he, he tells one story. He went, uh, uh, four days in a row without anybody speaking English in South America. Oh boy. And, and the challenge is he has to be at the show, you know, at the very minimum an hour in advance for the sound check and all the rest of it and mm-hmm. practice. So he can't not miss a show. <laughs> right. And when they were doing their European tour, um, he was riding in Europe and in Africa and in Asia and, and places where, you know, you don't normally even think to vacation and still never, never missed a show. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. And he's got, so I, I, I thoroughly recommend, uh, he wrote, ended up writing five books about, um, his life doing this kind of stuff. A couple of them are about motorcycling and another one about bicycling, another one about just being a musician and being, you know, drummer and all the rest of it. But he has some really cool things to say because he's also the lyricist for the band. He writes all the words. And he said, you know, a lot of these musicians, they achieve a level of fame and they get further removed from their audience because they're up on stage. And he said, how can you write a song about, you know, the everyman if you're not connected with the everyman? So, yeah. And, And he was the guy then who would be in the gas station asking directions, asking about a good restaurant, where's a good hotel, talking about the motorcycle uh-huh. and who knows how many thousands of people met him not having any clue who he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that had to be pretty cool on, on, for him as well. A good experience where you, you get to talk to genuine people who are talking to you just because they think you're a regular guy too. And not because you, because you're Neil Pert from rush. You right. Know what I mean? So that's gotta be great for him. Yes, and and by nature he's he's pretty shy. He normally doesn't do interviews. He's not a limelight kind of guy. Uh-huh. But he admitted to being um, uh, an extremist in in basically everything he does. So when he was a kid, he loved to read. He read and read and read and read and read. Pretty soon he discovered drums, so he put the books away and mm. became became you know the best drummer in the world basically. Mm. Uh, but then he got you know finding boredom between tour cities on the bus and he started reading again so his goal was to read every book ever written well you, you can't do that you know but no, you can't. L- kind of literally that was his goal so he he has read every every possible subject and every possible you know famous author and not famous either which just expanded his vocabulary and his, his intellect so it's really cool to hear him talk about this stuff because he uses words that you don't use every day and he uses the meaning of words that you don't necessarily understand um you know like, like, like splendiferous like splendiferous which is you know if they did another album that's what the name is <laughs> he, he revealed me. that yeah he revealed that <laughs> oh sweet <laughs> but he talks about the, the term um enthusiasm you know it, it, it's his goal to to inspire somebody to do something based on his drum work, his music, his writings, whatever. His greatest honor is if he inspires somebody to do something, then the flame is passed from him to somebody else. And the term enthusiasm, apparently, according to Neil, um, actually is a Greek term that means fire of the gods. And if you can spread that fire, you've shared your enthusiasm, and that inspires others. And it's a pretty meaningful concept. And uh, people that share that kind of stuff are good people, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, it was great. Uh, so here I am, you know, just your, your local dopey guy marching yeah, around yeah, his yeah. neighborhood with a set of headphones on listening to this stuff, you know? And, and for me, it was nice because I got to, you know, that's as close as I'm ever going to get to this guy. Um, but these interviews are out there and they're, they're free on YouTube. So I can listen and try and absorb and aspire and be inspired by him to hopefully do whatever I do or we do or our shop or team or relationships to do them at a high level because there's, there's meaning in doing that and there's satisfaction. And next thing you know, mile and a half went by and I didn't even notice, you know, hey, so it's a, how about that? It, yes. Right. So I'm receiving benefits from that that are, uh, that weren't planned. Um, yeah. I, I enjoy my walking time so much now uh, because it's it's time. I do it at night. My neighborhood's quiet and safe, so I got nothing to worry about. And it, it gets me one-on-one time with people that have so much to offer 
that I don't have during the day. You know, there's too much just other things going on. So this is how I've been preparing to uh, hopefully do a better job, um, not only at SEMA, but in, in all the silly stuff we do, you know, with the cars and videos and whatnot. Uh, right. So tonight was uh, actually a little different direction. I, I was listening to an awesome Michael Jordan interview. Oh, uh, nice. Yes. I got a list. I got a list of people. I mean, there are those who are, you know, these these super achievers that uh -huh. have, have always fascinated me. And, and, you know, you lay the question down, are you or can you be the best at anything? Can I be the best at anything? I, I don't know. I, I can't possibly see that. Um, I know you're darn good at what you do in your daily. And, and the, what I think is interesting about a guy like you is your daily profession is not necessarily what your morning to night passion is, but you still yeah. kill it. Well, yeah, I'm, it's, if, if you gotta do it, you might as well do it the best you can do. So. And I, right. and what it helps that I do enjoy it. I, I really like helping people. So I get to help people all day. And that's what makes it really worth it. And, and I learn a lot. And I love to learn. So, and I always want to get better and be better and, you know, be the best I can be. So it's, this is a good spot for me to do that. Yeah. No, and, it, and it's cool and it shows. And, in fact, that's how you got your fishing trip last week is because you killed some competition, right? You're that's right, right man. Yeah, so there you go. He's showing them young guys how to do this. You whippersnappers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And and to me, you know, Jordan is on in that list of of people that are the best at what they do. You know, just like Pert, Neil Pert. Uh -huh. And I know, or I've learned, that there is not a secret to this. Um, it is known how you can become the best. Uh, it requires. Passion, it requires desire, it requires discipline, it requires hard work, it requires, you know, Neil says he's a slow learner, but a great practicer. Ah, that's, that's huge. <laughs> it is. So, you know, Jordan talks about this particular thing I listened to last night, and, and it's got personal significance for me because when I grew up in the Chicago area, I lived through all the Bulls championships um, and, and watched all those and watched him play. And there are those who say, yeah, he's a guy who throws a ball through a hoop. You know, why is he making so much money and what's the big deal? And, yeah, you're right. Um, the same way Neil Peart says, he's a guy who gets paid to hit things with sticks. Yeah, <laughs> right on. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can't do it the way he does and, yeah. and with both those guys. And his ability to lead a team and focus a team – on a common goal and then to achieve that goal relentlessly year after year after year. And he talks about how hard it is to get to be the best, but it's harder to stay the best uh -huh. uh, because everybody's gunning for you. And as time marches on, your, your physical condition changes. Yeah. And so the, the speech was, or the interview was basically the, the day before he got inducted into the basketball hall of fame. And they were asking him about uh, what it was like, you know, to be in the Hall of Fame. And he said, to me, the Hall of Fame was always something that you do at the end. And he said, I'm far from finished, you know. Wow. Um, and there was an aspect to this that I never considered. And that is when Jor Jordan, was, so he retired in 98. And right. his retirement was partially because his team had come apart, Um the, Phil Jackson was the coach of the Bulls, and, right. and he got a better offer to go somewhere else. Right. And some of the players all, because of partially because of Michael, they all grew so much and became so much better, they all became very marketable, and they ended up going to different teams. So the Bulls won six championships, uh, three and three. There was a little time off in between. And this guy had asked Jordan, was he was he ready to retire? Was it was it done? And and he actually said no. I think we could have gone seven seven games if the team stayed together. And he said we could have gone eight, nine, and ten. Oof. So can you imagine oh, the man. frustration of a guy who is the best and who is proving it, and the circumstance comes apart, and he can no longer be that force because right. you know. 
it was a pretty there's a lot to take from that yeah yeah all all the pieces uh weren't there anymore so you know mm-hmm. one one guy even though jordan gets pretty much all of the credit for those championships it was not all jordan no and i mean it was his his um the rest of his team all all putting out a thousand percent to win that to win those championships that made it happen he happened to be the face of it right and and largely um he he's the kind of guy that if you're going to grow you want to be around um not because he's a nice guy and a fun guy and everything else but he was so uh, demanding of his teammates yeah, and, sure. and he would he would demonstrate genuine disappointment if you screwed up mhm because he knew you could do it right. you know he, he had the ability to believe in himself and believe in others and sometimes i know so when we were in, when i was in college my buddies and i we used to do uh in the summertime and and whatnot we go to local parks in the chicago area and, and do little pickup basketball games and there was five or six of us that would get together every night we knew we, you know we we're all best friends so we knew each, ourselves obviously and mm-hmm. we'd be playing playing against people you don't know mm-hmm. and that was some of the best times I ever had. Um, basketball is fun, but what was really, really fun about it was I knew where each guy on my team was all the time. You know, we were in tune with what each other was doing. I knew if this, you know, was a breakaway and this guy had it, he's going to shoot it from this side and I can get the rebound and we can do it. Uh-huh. Uh, just that cohesive team thing. And a lot sure. of people talk about team sports, and uh, but I think – I was lucky enough to have a true, you know, piece of the machine team experience. And it, it's funny, it didn't come in, in, in a high school sport or it didn't come in anything organized. It was just uh-huh. us. And we all played this game because we mm-hmm. enjoyed it and we had that desire. We wanted to go do it. So common goal and, and again, shared disappointment. These are great friends. But if uh-huh. somebody missed a shot, we would all give them a ton of crap. You know, yeah. it's like, what the hell's the matter with you? You yeah. had that. Dude, you're <laughs> right. buying beers tonight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and 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 that today, even more so, is is I find it hard to be in that situation because uh, we're in a different time now. And I'm th- this was 20 years ago that I you know we used to play these games, but it seems today that there's so much more consideration of hurting feelings and and you know political correctness, where if something uh, you know, doesn't go right, you have to approach, or at least I feel it, it's expected that you approach things differently, um, which might be better, but it's not the same. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and, and I'm not saying you got to be a jerk about it, but, mm-hmm. you know, I think the fear is that if something doesn't go right and you go to that person and say, okay, you know what? Um, you know, to be blunt for our show here, but this is a letdown because this didn't go well. Right. <laughs> you know, not, not saying you screwed up, but saying, you know, that there, there was a better opportunity here to do something better and it didn't happen. Right. It, it feels like you can't really come out and do that stuff. You, you, you have to approach things from a softer standpoint these days for, for fear of demotivating that person. Right. And having them either do worse or become more self-conscious or leave or whatever, as opposed to fueling the fire and throwing a log on the fire. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what Jordan was saying is he grew up in a, co- in a competitive household with his brothers and his sister and everybody had high expectations. And if you screwed up, all it did was fuel you to go do better next time. Yeah. And I, I think that's a special personality and not everybody has that, you know? Well, yeah, absolutely. We, we had a guy in, in my job, young kid, uh, what was he, 22, no, 20, 24. And he just, just wasn't motivated and was not learning, was not improving. And I, it, we just never, and maybe it's a failure on our part, but he just never found what he needed to really excel. And we ended yeah. up firing him because he just yeah. wasn't getting it. Yeah, unfortunately, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just it, it's too bad because you know we had high hopes for this guy, and 
either the job he didn't like it or he just his head was somewhere else or he wasn't in the right you know the right headspace to 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 excel here or whatever it was it just didn't happen and yeah. he just wasn't going to i think decided that he wasn't going to be better well and i think there's a couple things in play and one of them is that you know if you're not in the right job or whatever you're doing, if you're doing something that you don't dig, we all do things we don't have to, you know, we, right. we do stuff that we have to that we might not like right. every, every day. But if it's a career choice, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if somebody's working in our shop and they're miserable, we don't, it, it, it's bad for us to, you know, yeah. because you're not going to be happy, which means you're not going to do well. And there's nothing we can say or do. Mm-hmm. So we encourage people if they're, you know, if they end up working with us and, they, you know, it's not really what they're passionate about, mm-hmm. you need to find what you are passionate about and go kill it. You know, go right. do that. And no hard feelings. Not at all. No, yeah. it's good. Hard friends and that'll be great. Go for it. Yeah. And at, at the same time, um, we hear a lot of the talk about a whole generation that grew up with participation trophies and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't have, you know, we don't have kids, so I, I didn't, you know, raise kids in that type of environment. But I think with that, that kind of, um, limits their exposure to the type of really awesome team scenario that I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't work hard to earn or win something and get the joy of doing it, you don't get motivated to do it again. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So I, th- I think that might have been your boy's problem is maybe his upbringing didn't put him in a situation where he had, he was forced to do something that he truly didn't think he could mm-hmm. and just worked and worked and worked and did it and said, wow, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I want to try something else and keep going. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. I, it's, it's very possible. Very possible. Yeah. When, when I started that job, I was flipping petrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah because i i mean i doing what i was doing being a field technician i knew what i was doing because i'd been doing it for so long and i was not to you know pat myself on the back but i was, I was pretty good at it yeah and uh, then i i moved into a more of a, a, a stationary place i'm making phone calls i'm helping people over the phone and at first it's really really weird because when i'm doing something i'm used to being at the location, putting my hands on this equipment, figuring it out, talking to the people in person, and the whole dynamic changed. And mm-hmm. I had to really adjust to that and figure out how am I going to do this, man? I got to do this. Otherwise, you know, what if, what if I can't go back out in the field? What if I crash and burn at this? You know, I can't crash and burn at this. I got, a, I got a family to think about, you know? Right, right. So yeah, yeah. that's a heck of a motivator. And yeah. Yeah, and and slowly I, you know, pick things up, you know, got my about my my phone cadence uh, down, and you learn how to talk to these people uh, a, a bit better, and it's I'm really starting to excel at this now, which is great. So that is great. A lot of fun learning a new skill and improving that skill. Well, yeah. and and hats off to you for doing it because in that position I would probably not excel. Uh, just because to me, I, I can solve a problem once. I can't do it over and over again for people because even though it's a different person, I'd probably lose my mind. So <laughs> again, you've helped us tremendously in the shop with helping us with some of our equipment technology that I owe you for that. So thank uh, you. No worries. No worries. Uh, Making the seam. Well, I think we're even. Well, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Let's do that afterwards, you know. Yeah, right. When my feet fall off. <laughs> right, right. Um, but again, you're the type of person who knows that okay, this is a challenge, and if I if I beat this thing, I'm going to get something out of it. So, it, of course, the, the family motivator is there too. Um, but I, that's why I think you know, working on cars, you can get that kind of experience in a in a one on one. You don't necessarily have to be on a sports team. But if you're going to set out to uh, uh, to install a part or figure out how to do a tune-up or repair something, you know, the repairs are great, especially when you got to drive that thing to work on Monday. Yeah. And you've got to get it fixed now. So there's your deadline. There's your pressure. And you, you have to reach out to new resources to maybe learn the trick. Maybe you got to find tools and whatever. 
But when you turn the key and it starts and runs, and you go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great feeling. It is. And I Huge know that. lift off your shoulders, too. Boy, howdy. Sure. And, and there's all kinds of benefits. You learned a skill. You had, yeah. you had the, the mental wherewithal to make it happen. You might have saved yourself some money. You burned some time, but it's personal growth time, I, I fully believe. And, um, you know, like me, I, I have to do stuff on the car two and three times often because I don't get it right, you know, and, and it might be right enough, but is it right enough for the, the standard that we want or, or the customer standard is a different story. Hmm. So there's, yeah, there's, yeah, being the home, the home mechanic and doing all that, maybe you get some new tools out of, out of the job too, which is always nice, always a plus. Yeah, right. And there's a guy on uh, one of the forums on Lateral G, I think, who, who pointed out he justifies doing his own repairs uh, because he takes like half the money that he would have spent on the repair to invest in his tool set. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, the car gets fixed. Yeah. It was cheaper, and he's got something that he can do more with with tools. Absolutely. I, I, I think the exact same way that that guy does. So I, I got to do a timing, timing belt on my wife's car. Um, it's at 100,000 miles, and it's ready for a timing belt. And, and it's not, it doesn't look like a very bad job, but... You got to get special tools to lock the cams, the cams in place, and lock the crankshaft in place. And it's it's not that much. It's like twenty five, thirty dollars for this little tool set. But if I get to buy this tool set, the whole the whole job will cost me, you know, maybe one hundred and seventy five dollars. Where take it to the shop would cost me five or six hundred. So right. winner winner. Yes, and then you got to just do some of the techniques that we talked about in the past, you know, get that time cleared, protect that time, yeah. get, get your yeah, resources exactly. lined up in case you need help and, uh, and, and go through it. So, but you're the kind of guy who knows that because you've been through this before. Oh, yeah. So, so you get that benefit. And the, the challenge is to expose people to this concept who've never done it before. Um, and especially the kids, the youth, you know, you, we need to somehow let them know that, you you only grow outside of your comfort zone, and that never stops. Mm-hmm. And if you find yourself in a routine, um, I got nothing against routine. Sometimes I feel I need more routine because I do so many different kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, but but again, to use uh, Rush for an example, Neil Peart would ride around and see things he'd never saw before, and then his routine was being the best drummer that night mm-hmm. at the concert. So he was. You know, it's funny, the opposite, what many people think would be the big challenge and the, the nervous part about performing was uh-huh. where he locked down and did his thing, you know, because that was his, what he's trained for. That was his right. thing. His job, yeah. And then he got out and got out of the comfort zone to go right around. Um, it, I don't know. It's fascinating to me. And and on those lines, I think I can f- finally release a little bit of getting out of our comfort zone, which involves you again, my friend, um, oh, yeah. com- com- coming up at the Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals this oh, November. Yeah. Uh, we created what I hope is not a monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I am going to uh, uh, let out some, some secrets here. And uh, part of what I'm learning also from these people that have atri- achieved these levels of greatness is that, uh, you know, we're all vulnerable and it's okay to admit, you know, where you're at. So, uh, what we're going to do, uh, part of the challenge of the Muscle Car Corvette Nationals is sharing the stories of these cars because these cars are, are the, you know, some of the most either, you know, unusual or rare or prime examples of, of awesome muscle cars and Corvettes. But a, a consumer can walk into that show and go, oh, look, a blue Chevelle. Oh, look, a green GTO. Uh-huh. And not know the, the, how cool the story is of what that car is and maybe how it got here and all that stuff. And I've been fortunate to have worked with that organization and, and help, you know, MC it a little bit and pull some covers off and do some reveals and, and shoot a lot of video and do a lot of interviews with people. So people tell me these stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I kind of share them you know, through that media. But one of the cool things about the show is that they're very media savvy and they appreciate cameras and coverage. So overnight between Saturday, their big opening day of the show and Sunday, the second day, uh, that night they leave all the lights on. And if you are credentialed media, 
you could hang out there and get photos and videos and you have this whole entire show to yourselves. Um, and there's only, you know, maybe a few dozen members of the media, which is a right. decent, a decent amount, but it's big enough to where, you, you know, you cannot really see anybody else. Right. And get this insanely special time amongst these cars. So, uh, I had talked to Bob Ashton about taking advantage of that time and maybe we do an overnight live video broadcast from the show floor in which we can tell those stories uh, to an audience around the world that is sharing this live video stream and we'll have guests and we'll have car owners that are guests and sponsors and stuff and uh, we're going to call it the uh, McCacken you know the acronym for the Muscle Car Corporate Nationals right. McCacken After Hours Live and Bob said that's one of your top five best ideas ever. <laughs> nice. nice. So, not to say that I have good ideas, but I, I, I believe in this one. I think this is going to be a really cool thing. Now I'm, so I got the go ahead from Bob um, to produce this thing, and now we're figuring out how we're going to do it. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm coming clean a little bit saying, you know, we've done a lot of live video, which is, you know, a lot of it's been cell phones and, you know, whatever. And we're stepping up the production to use multiple cameras and use networked cameras that are connected wirelessly and a video switcher, which is where we're going to employ our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Hubal Clark, hey uh, to be the technology guy and, and um, be kind of calling the shots on camera angles and stuff and controlling that side of it. Plus, if we do have some kind of giant networks failure, maybe your day-to-day -day in and out experience might be able to help us there. Maybe. We'll see. But, well, folks, I, I apologize beforehand. <laughs> Not that we're expecting those type of failures. And, and, and so now we're, we're doing the due diligence of getting our hands on the hardware and doing some trial runs. And, and, and there's many things to consider because we're looking at going live right around 8 p.m. on Saturday night, which is basically right after the doors close of the show. To maybe who knows when, maybe it's midnight, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. And it's going to stream on Facebook Live, which is great because other people can share it. And we've got mm -hmm. some companies that are going to share it with some big footprints socially. Um, we're obviously going to share it on VATV and on Muscle Car of the Week and on uh, the McCacken channel. Plus, we're going to simulcast the stream to YouTube for our YouTube channel live on VATV. Um, so there's some opportunities for some technology hiccups that we're trying to get ahead of. Um, and then there's the, the whole other side of the content. You know, we're doing a live show. So <laughs> there's many opportunities uh, for this guy to uh, drop the ball there. <laughs> well, that'll be a first. I've yet to see that. So well, there you go. I appreciate that. But maybe uh, my... you, th you thrive in a live environment, which is which is. One of your best features. Well, I, I enjoy it. Um, I, I do like that pressure, uh, and I think it's fun. And and maybe you know my basketball pickup game days have taught me how to pick the ball up when I drop it in a manner that maybe you don't notice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess that that's part of it, right? It gets dropped. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> um, so we're developing all this kind of real time, and that that's. That's coming up in November. We don't have a whole lot of time to do it. So I am uh, fully kind of stepping out of the comfort zone in, in a couple different directions. I'm getting into my comfort zone in others, uh, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing this, and, and I'm hoping that uh, it goes. I don't want to say goes as planned because I'm not really – I'm not locking down to a, a, a planned vision of how this is going to go. Um because I really don't want it to be that way. I'm looking forward to it taking directions that we're not sure of. Uh -huh. um, but we're, we're lining up some guests and, um, and trying to secure a couple sponsors to help us out because there's some costs involved. Uh -huh. And uh, Ben, our in-house camera video guy, he's excited about it. And uh, everybody we've talked to so far has been like, yeah, this is going to be great. So it's going to yeah. be cool. I'm excited about this. I'm glad. I'm glad you're going to be able to be a part of it. And, yeah, uh, for sure. It's um, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the very basics of telling stories about cool cars. So, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. to me, that's second nature. That's easy. We're just going to make sure that the rest of it goes well, which I think we're 
we're sharp enough now to hopefully be able to figure it out. And if it goes down in a ball of flames, well, that'll be kind of fun, too. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook's most infamous moments. Yes. The, Number the, the, one, the, McCacken After Hours Live. Well, that's right. That's right. The, the biggest automotive media failure of all time. You know, Maybe I can add that to the list. That'd be fun. <laughs> No, oh, that's right. awesome. That's awesome. Really, really uh, excited about it. So between SEMA and then that, and then uh, we're looking at maybe doing a few things at the PRI show in December, we're, we're really gearing up for an action-packed back half of the year. So getting full circle to my story about trying to sharpen up a little bit and be in, uh, in a good space physically to, to handle all this um, is why I've been marching around my neighborhood at night uh, listening to uh, inspirational speeches, and I apologize to my neighbors if I look like some kind of a weirdo. But you're wearing like a headband and you know ankle weights and all that stuff. Oh yeah, it's all uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Newton-John, uh, windbreaker, and <laughs> <70 laughs> <cute> shorts. <laughs> right. It's all white, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, surprisingly, I just. Uh, I basically just wear what I wear from work, and then I take it off and throw it in the hamper. So, nice. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I've been lucky, no injuries, no no sore knees sure. or feet or anything. Uh, sure. Everything feels good, so. Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need to, I need to follow suit on that deal. Well, <sighs> you know, again, I, moving a, uh, an exercise machine just to move the machine, to me, I always mentally thought I could be doing something that creates – you know, a work by a product rather than just push his weights around. Uh -huh. So I never really, I was never one of those guys who could just go work out for hours uh -huh. uh, because I always had other stuff to do. Right. And, and now by, by tuning into these, you know, to listen to other people, I feel like I'm getting something out of that in addition well, to the, to the exercise. And um, it's the first time really in a long time that I've been able to, I guess, you know, the next best thing would be to put a team together and go play some pickup basketball, but I'm nowhere near in shape enough to do that. <laughs> oh, <God>. My <laughs> heart would explode if I tried to do that right now. Holy cow. Yes, yes. So, uh, well, great. That was another great show about cars. Yeah, yeah. This, this was a very zen episode, man. I love it. I'm snapping my fingers. I like yeah, it. right, right. Hopefully we don't. <laughs> Offend our handful of listeners uh, <laughs> for veering off topic. Uh, but, well, you know. it's, it's it's fun to to switch it up a little bit here and there. So. Yeah, yeah, you definitely have to, and and I'm just you know telling it like it is. So, yeah. well, to to bring things back around, we we have our uh, trivia questions that are looming in the uh, in the ether here. Yes, yes, they're looming heavy overhead. Um, so you can uh, reveal your answers first, and I know I probably failed miserably again. Okay. So. I wouldn't say miserably. Um, I asked you in 1968 uh, the Dodge Scat Pack cars and what, what were those cars, and you said Charger RT, or you said Charger. I said Charger, yeah. Uh, you said Dart, and that is correct. You said Super B, and that is correct, but you did not say Cornet. It was a Cornet. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, well, I don't feel that bad. Three out of four. That, not bad at all, man. Cause I'd, have said, I'd have said Duster, probably. Uh, but the, there wasn't a 68 Duster yet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you, get me, it. you finally get me now. <laughs> I do, yeah. The world would be different if the Duster was born in 68. Exactly. Um, part of the part of my my hang up on this was that to me a coronet and the super B are both B bodies, so I didn't know if it covered. I got gotcha. you. You know, another both... piece of trivia I learned is that in order to be qualified as a scat pack car, it had to run uh, in four fourteens or better in a quarter mile. Yes, yes, I do remember that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That is cool. <laughs> Neat stuff, the scat pack and the rapid transit system and the high impact colors that eventually came out. Uh, great, great, um, cars, but also cool collectibles that go along with it. And, uh, Tim Wellborn at the Wellborn Museum has like the scat pack, uh, uh, and rapid transit system kits that you could buy, like the fan, fan oh, really? uh, club stuff. So it was like, a, it's a jacket and a patch and a catalog. Oh, nice. 
Oh yeah, yeah. He he brought all that to McCacken one year. He, I guess uh, I think maybe he purchased it from some guy who brought it to the show to hand it off. Oh, and I was gotcha. l- looking at some of that jazz, and it's cool. So it's another reason to go to that show. All right. Well, so right. I almost almost got it right. Yeah. Well, I keep three quarter credit. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, on your end, we had the uh, 1986, we'll call it, uh, uh, Omni GLH Shelby car. And what did the GLH stand for? And your answer was great looking hatch. Hatch. Hell yeah. Um, Hell no. Which, well, could it, you know, the great looking part, it was all black. Um, so it was the best looking that car could have looked, I think. Right. And it was just on the beginning of the whole hot hatch, uh-huh. you know, movement of, of those cars. So the, the terminology fits. So I'll give you that. I appreciate uh, that. In reality, knowing it was a Shelby product, uh, you won't be surprised to learn that the correct acronym was Goes Like Hell. Ah! <laughs> Damn you, Shelby. Damn yeah. you. Yeah, he pulled no punches. Oh. And uh, one of the fun things about that car is... Again, it was kind of poo-pooed by the Shelby crowd because it wasn't, they didn't consider it, it wasn't rear drive, it didn't have a V8, it was this little economy junk. And he said, look, kids, this thing's fast. And he threw down the gauntlet, they did that episode, or that uh, issue of Hot Rod Magazine with the, with the GT350. But what he also did is he challenged the Ferrari club. And he said, all you Ferrari guys with your 308s and, and the stuff that you could buy back then, he said, meet me at the track and we will see which one lays down the uh, the big, the fastest lap time, yeah. and nobody took him up on it. Oh, man. I, I believe that that Shelby was a fast car. Cause I, they used that that 2.2 turbo in a couple of minivans, a couple of um, uh, Dodge Caravans, and I knew a kid that had one of these, and that was a fast minivan. Yeah, I mean, relatively, definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, but that, that Omni GLH was a, a legitimate low 14 second car. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, they think it had to weigh next to nothing. Right. And it, they said, uh, you know, <laughs> when you're ready to put the hammer down, make sure it's pointed in the direction you want it to go. Uh-huh. And, and, and it actually, it, it cornered okay, but it had just this tremendous torque steer that, you know, was sure. kind of dangerous. Um, but, Shelby was actually kind of behind it, you know. He he wasn't uh, he didn't do it just to put his name on something and collect a royalty check again, mm-hmm. which he he, he did. Right. Uh, at the time, he was actually suing Ford, so he was making a bunch of money off that. But oh boy. that's a different story. Different story altogether. Yeah. Find out right. next time on V8 Radio. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Who knows? So, all right, man. Well, this was uh, this was fun. This was, it was uh, fun. Good to go in a slightly different direction, yeah, cool. and uh, appreciate the time. If you enjoy this show, uh, it's available on iTunes, uh, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, uh, the um, TuneIn app, which I still think is my my favorite way to consume this, right. uh, because on my Amazon device, I, I have the TuneIn app, and I can stream it right through my TV set or in my garage with my system there, so that's fun. Um, or, of course, our Facebook page or right on V8Radio.com. And uh, that's uh, that's about all I got for this one. So right on. I guess until next time, uh, keep the shiny side up. And uh, we will see you next time on V8 Radio. <laughs>